Now, I'm just putting this up because I downloaded this, I don't know how long ago, and, I, and unfortunately I never made a reference of where on the web I got it from. But um, you may find it interesting who the author is. And that's Peter Schiffstad, I believe. And anyone who does know Erwin Schiff knows maybe where it's um, trouble he got into the tax office, I think. I'm not sure the details. But I'm not sure where this was written. It, it looks to me like it was done in the um, 1930s or thereabouts, or maybe in the 40s. But, really? Um, it's, it is literally a little sort of manga, or a comic, um, and it, you can see this thing, and it starts off with a fish story, which is why as soon as Rudy started talking about the fish, I straight away remember that I had this. And you can see here, you know, uh, once upon a time, and you've got these three guys, and, and it really goes through the story, you know, saying sort of the things that Rudy was saying. But it goes a lot more into banking. They set up this whole economy on this island, and there's bankers, and the money is fish. <laughs> And they end up debasing the currency by hollowing out the fish. So people are getting less fish, but they still need to eat, so they end up needing more fish because they're hungry. You know, so anyway, on it goes. But um, if you look at for that how an economy grows, urban shift, I suppose on Google it will come up. Maybe that's for those who are interested. But I'll just jump to one other page, which I thought was amusing. Unnatural disasters. Throughout history, unnatural disasters have been caused by the non-productive politicians meddling in the natural economic order to steal the productivity and, well, I'll just scroll down slowly and you can get the gist of it. It's quite amusing, the, um, the drawings, really, I think. There, there's the meddling machine. <laughs> Stock market has fallen over and down there is the poor fellow who's got tax being grabbed off him. Jobs being pulled out from under him, and there's a. I'm not sure what that walking thing is. Recession. I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, it's a crushing. Now this reminds me. I don't know. Um, reminds me of a cartoonist in the 70s. What was he called? That. Um, Crum. Crum. Harry Crum. That's right. So it might, I don't know. I mean, it looks very similar. Maybe he did this in the 70s. I'm not sure. But anyway, I just thought that was uh, something that you may find amusing. Okay, Comex stocks. So what do stocks look like? So there's some stocks for you. <laughs> Are they the gold-plated tungsten bars? No, 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 no. No, that's actually LBMA. It's a photo of the net. That's the LBMA vault, but anyway, that's what stocks are. You can get mesmerised by that. I find I do sometimes. Just staring endlessly at wondering what it'd be like to walk around there. Punching it. <laughs> Unfortunately, Perthman doesn't have anywhere near. <laughs> Maybe one day, I don't know. Inventory envy. Yeah, that's right. So, what are stocks? There's two sorts of stocks. There's actually three. The first one's registered. And what that means is it's been warrant, a warrant's been issued, and it's stock, it's stock that is pledged for a contract, so it's sort of locked in for when that contract matures, it's going to be delivered. And then there's a second type which is eligible, and it's not warranted, so it's not locked to a contract, it's in the COMEX system, it's in the right form, which is a kilo bar or a 100 ounce bar for gold, so it's potentially available for delivery. So it's still within the system. And interestingly, it includes some of the iShares ETF metal is in, in that number. Um, which is interesting because really, you know, the ITS ETF metal is backing the shares. So it gives an indication that it says it's eligible. It doesn't mean necessarily that it can be claimed and used for. So the person who owns that eligible metal is then got to go and say, I want to warrant it and register it. To, to, because I wish to sell it onto COMEX against a contract. And then of course in COMEX warehouses are other metal which is not reported, stuff that's not in the right form, so a 400 ounce bar is not the contract size for COMEX contract. Um, so just some, some understanding there. And all the charts that I've got are from Nick at Sherlings, 
And if you're not subscribed to that service, I'd really recommend it because he does all these charts plus more, and he updates them every day, and he goes up and then he pulls all sorts of data. It's a really great facility that he does. Who? Um, it's Nick. Nick Laird, yeah. yeah. He's a great guy. He's been doing this for decades. So this is his chart. Um, now I'll just point out that Nick um, uh, only started getting the split between registered, which is this, and eligible, which is this amount. So this light green is in here somewhere, but he only started to track it from 2001 onwards. Um, and it's quite an interesting resource because he got not all of this data going back that far is publicly available and you know he knew people, someone at work I think associated um, with Comex which is next to the World Trade Centre and he just got like photocopied records of this sort of stuff before it collapsed and things like that so he's got it's really valuable information um, that he's got there so you'll notice it's interesting of course that it's been increasing and it's significantly above where it was in the 1980s. So what is registered stock? And remembering that one of the functions, the main functions of the futures market is to act as this hedging mechanism for producers and users, real producers and users, so miners and then the jewellery industry and other sort of fabrication uses. And in that sense, they're always going to be delivering gold in and registering it because they've got the miner has a short contract and the jewellery manufacturer has pre-bought. So they want to put metal in and deliver it and they want to take it out and use it. So in some sense, the registered stock is what I call the industry float, the working inventory. Because um, it's real physical settlement, they really need to use it. And in some sense, that in should increase as the volume of business increases. So if the jewellery industry is doing really well, you know, the amount of throughput that they're pulling out a lot more, this little sort of bank account, you know, as your business becomes more successful, you have a larger and larger cash requirements in your bank account to handle the differences in inflows and outflows. So in some sense, to me, this registered stock is like the industry float. Um, unfortunately, we, don't, we can't go back too fast. There's not too much that we can draw from this because we don't, you really want to go back, uh, you know, some decades to actually see what the normal situation is. But it's interesting that it peaks 2006 and then sort of declining. Um, and I note that it peaks there at the time when gold broke through 600 and had that first spot. So that probably either that represents maybe build up for um, the minting game where they're trying to pull a lot of stock out so the throughput increases where they're needing to, to pull it out. And maybe the drop off is jewellery demand dropping off as the price starts to get higher and higher. But I can't really speculate too much on that amount. Um, eligible stock, so it was registered. Because obviously if you're a person who bought a contract and you want to take delivery, you'll take it, it's registered initially, then you're taking it and you're getting it converted because the contract's been fulfilled, you've got your gold, you get a receipt, it's in a COMEX warehouse, it technically then becomes eligible. You've got to actually re-warrant it, so I'm going to put it to this specific futures contract that I've short sold. So it was registered, and it represents in that way investors taking delivery. And in my mind, it's sort of a longer term storage. Okay, so if you bought a contract to take delivery, you've got a two choices. You can just leave it there within that system, uh, or you can literally take it out and move it to another depository. There's probably not much point in doing that if you think about it. Um, the question is, is that increase that we've seen, and as shown in the next chart, um, is it bullish or is it bearish? So you could easily argue, well, it shows increasing investor interest. But then the other side of the coin is it's increased potential supply that will come back into the market at the right price. So take your pick with your, you know, whatever um, line of the side you want to sit. I think it's difficult to really draw any firm, firm conclusions about it is absolutely bullish, absolutely bearish. All you can say, it does indicate more investors buying. The other thing to note is that in 2001 it was only 10% of the total COMEX stock, now it's 75. Of course, unfortunately we don't have the data going back to 1980 where we can see what the relationship was in 1980 and whether it indicates anything. So, but anyway, we can only work with what we've got. So you can see this huge increase as it's going up, which is, is in direct proportion. The, the 
gold price chart at the top is obviously very compressed, so you know, but we know the huge run up in the gold price. And that's sort of illustrated, so I took that data, excuse the dates on the bottom there, not sort of messed up somehow, but smoothed it out, so it's a 200 day, 200 day moving average, and looking at the gold price to the COMEX stocks. And of course, you'll see that's very strongly correlated. Indeed, that's about 85% correlation, which you've got to admit, from 1975 right till now, to maintain or to have a correlation, that's pretty, pretty strong correlation over such a long time period. You know, normally in time series like that, you compare, and you'd always get breakdowns and, and divergences. And there are divergences there, gold price going up, stocks going down, and vice versa. Is that the total stock or the stock? No, it's the total stocks. And yes, yeah, sorry, I'm using total stocks because again, you know, to me the registered and eligible, you move from one to the other, so it's a little bit hard to make any deductions. To me the bottom line is how much total gold sitting in those COMEX warehouses. Because really the eligible is potentially able to come into the market. Um, unfortunately, I looked at this data and thought, can I look at sort of some advanced correlation? So I'll try and move one time series out, you know, the COMEX stocks a little bit back and see whether it forward predicts. No, it doesn't. The interesting thing here is that this actually is completely um, unsurprising to me because this is exactly what we see in the Perth Depository. If I could give you a graph, and I wish I could, but they're sensitive about the commercial sensitivity of it. But if I could give you a graph of the depository holdings and the gold price, they're just like this. And what it says is that increasing prices drive increasing investor interest. Indeed, in our experience, what we find is that our holdings lag the gold price by a month. And indeed, what happens is they lag it to the high. And so what we surmise happens is, the reason they lag a month is because most people come in, they're instigated or um, motivated to buy gold, they open an account and then there's some delay, they take some time, I'm not sure when they're gonna buy, it's about a month later that they actually execute. So the holdings jump in advance of the account opening. But it's always driven by the high in the gold price. So as soon as we see a new high, that obviously triggers in my mind what happens is there's new headlines in newspapers, and that triggers a few more people to think, oh, I think I'd better get some gold. Is that Aussie dollar high or a <laughs> US, US dollar high? Yeah, US high. Because half of our clients are American. Well, 90% are overseas and half of, the, half of them are American. So yeah, it, it's more US price correlated. Any correlation between this uh, registered and uh, available and allocated and unallocated from, from your perspective? Uh, it's the same, it's, it's even, it's, yeah, from our point of view. So I just noticed that, so it, it is normal behaviour, at least from what we see. Now maybe we're just dealing more at the retail end, we have institutional interest, but you know, maybe that's just how we're, we're representing more of the retail interest, but that's certainly not surprising for me. But I just want to put those numbers in context. There's a lot of people, well, because it's publicly available data, we get excessive analysis of it. Um, so keep in mind, of course, total gold, I rough, rounded this out, 160,000 tonnes. Central banks, which are you know, investors, really, um, about 29. Investors are around 27 tonnes. I'm just using World Gold Council numbers and I've tried to, a couple of years old, so I've tried to sort of extrapolate, but you know, give or take a few thousand, what does it matter? <laughs> um, out of that, what I call known visible is only 2,200 tonnes. And then out of that, you've got ETFs, which we can see, we can see what they've got. Let's leave to the moment whether it's real. Um, and then COMEX is 300. Okay. So my point, of course, is that it's, as stock holding, very, very small compared to the total amount of investable material that's in the market. And that chart, which I developed with Nick, um, because being a sort of, not that anyone else in the company was really cared, but I was extremely interested when eGold started up. I thought, this is great, this is gold as money. So I started tracking this guy as soon as he started in every week I'd go on his website and write down how many ounces he had. And the same with gold money and boy involved and a few of the others. But Nick didn't have that data, so I combined my data with all his great ETFs sucking out data that he's got, and he's produced this chart. And so that huge COMEX chart that you saw, it doesn't look very impressive now, does it? There's a huge mountain of 
ETF metal on top. Um, the silver one's really interesting. Okay, what I look at there is I, I look at this as a business person and say um, the the COMEX has lost market share. It looks to me like you know in the 1990s there was some interest in silver. COMEX showed that now it's going into the ETFs, not through COMEX. ETFs have sort of upsurged. And, and are taking some of that investor interest now. So instead of people holding it in COMEX and buying contracts, they're buying ETFs. So I'm not sure what the people at COMEX think, but you know, they're a business and they're about volume, so that, that probably should be of, of concern to them. And just to get it into real numbers, um, wow. so Gold Boy Securities, World Gold Council product, is the big boy, 5%, but only 5% of the known investor. I'm excluding central banks here, so this number down the bottom, 864 million, isn't that a great that's number? Great. I love it. But that's just that 27 ton. Okay, it's not central banks, it's not the 160, it's just what the World Gold Council, Goldfield Mineral Services estimates is investor metal bars and coins, you know, in investable form. So all these ETF products, 60 million, and then COMEX is sitting here at 1% of this number, just just an easily 10 million, you know. And Tocom, oh, I don't even know why, they should just give up, I think. <laughs> so, you know, what, what we see, what we can track in terms of what's moving in and out is 7%. There's this 92% held off in Swiss banks, buried under backyards, wherever it is. Um, so I just, want to, I just want to make that point because I'm not saying that watching what COMEX does is not important. I'm just saying put it in context and, and keep in mind that there's a lot of other metal that's you know, off the system. Um, but COMEX is important because it does indicate, it's probably like a little leading indicator um, of what's going on. And the fact that its behaviour in relation to the gold price is similar to what I see in depository tells me, OK, maybe it is a, an indicator. The other point to make, of course, is that because it is only 1%, we can't, we've got to keep it in the back of our mind that that means that potentially its stocks could be manipulated. Because a bullion bank who's maybe holding some of that 800 million ounces could easily just deliver a whole lot of metal into COMEX for no other reason to just to store it there. They're not going to do it if you're not short selling, not doing anything with it, but they're just going to stick it in there to make the inventories look bigger than they are or take out metal that they've got in there for whatever purpose. So you've always got to keep that in the back of your mind. I'm not, I don't know whether they do that or not, you know, but again, because it's relatively small, you've got to keep that in the back of your mind that the big boys might go, wait a minute, if I know that so-and-so analysts are all looking at the COMEX stock figure, well, maybe I can play around with it by moving a bit of metal in there and moving some of it out and confusing people. But anyway, I want to get to backwardation. Um, because the reason I'm doing this presentation is because I professor made some statement about the inventory levels and it had got me thinking. And so backwardation is that future price less than the cash price. So it's this deal, they say, sell us your gold now and trust us that dot dot will have it to sell back to you in the future for less. Now we know that if you look at that increase to 9 million ounces, now, these people in COMEX have been accumulating for a long period of time. So, there's, so we know they're longish term holders, and it's not just going up and coming back down that inventory, they're sitting on it. So if backwardation appears, it gives the opportunity to earn some additional profit while you're waiting for the eventual selling price that you, you know, maybe you're waiting for it to go to $2,000 an ounce. So if you're a long term holder and you see backwardation and you go, well, I'll just sell it now for a future claim and I'll get the difference because I'm selling at a higher price and I'm buying a future contract lower so I'll make some money and then in the future I'll get back my goal and I can just continue sitting on it to the point that at the some point in the future that I expect that I'm going to really want to sell it permanently. So the question is why would you not take this offer? This is a great deal. Okay? Now why not? Okay. Reason is, is the exchange of a current claim that you have for physical gold to a future claim for question mark. Okay. So it's a counterparty risk. 
And there's two counterparty risks. There's counterparty risk to COMEX and then to the underlying short. Now what do I mean by that? Remember in COMEX, it's a margining, has margin required. You don't stump up the full cash when you enter into a contract and put into a margin. And then of course there's a call point. I'm not sure the exact amount of margin and the point at which they call, but there's a margin and they call you if it's starting to drop below whatever threshold. So let's say the margin's 10% and when your margin drops to 5% of the price of the contract that you've got, they call for you to top it back up to 10. Now that assumes that of course that um, COMEX has got that margin estimation correct. If for example, the gold price, you're holding a contract and the gold price moves up, you're short, and you had 10% cover and all of a sudden, because the contract's increased, it's now only five. And then they ring you up and call and say you've got to top up some more cash. It's like margin lending on shares. What happens if the gold price jumps 20%? Before you're able to stump up the money, and what's Comex stuck with? They're stuck now with a party on one side who actually hasn't got the margin to cover and got to close it out, but they can't close it out because they'll lose money if they close it out. And what if we get in a situation where the price doesn't never come back? It stays at that level. Okay, so the thing of COMEX that you've got to keep in mind is that COMEX is looking back in the past and looking at the volatility of the gold price and going, well, we think 10% is enough to cover us. Okay, they're not thinking like we are, not thinking, well, but what happens if it shoots up or if the volatility starts to increase? So, there is some implicit trust in that that margin's enough to cover for that volatility. And then of course in the end, on some of the short side, do they have the backing for that? Because there are two types of course as speculators who have different margin requirements higher than commercials, the supposedly commercials are hedged. So yes, they may be short or long, but they have got, or they say to COMEX, I have a long position. If I'm short, I have a long position myself somewhere else. So generally, for example, I'm a broker. Yes, I appear to be short, but that's because my client, I'm long to my client. It's the client that's actually short. But then, of course, that raises the question, well, what have cover have you got that the client, you know, that you're saying that you have a long position with that client? Is that a good long position? Has that client got money? You've just done that on margin. And so it kind of goes down the chain. Now it's quite easy at COMEX to go in and, you know, and someone to say, well here I've got all these warehouse receipts in London, the physical that is backing my short position, okay, that's probably safe. But if it's just a broker who's got a client who he's lent margin to or basing it on some other sort of collateral, we start to get a question of, again, counterparty risk. This is normally not a problem in normal situations, normal volatility where the market's operating in a case. But if we think as we do that, that can't always be the same, and it maybe it will change, then there is risk there. Now what I would say around backwardation, don't know what the professor will think, but just because the market goes into backwardation, to me, can reflect counterparty aversion, not necessarily currency aversion. It's not necessarily indicating to me when I see sometimes backwardation occurring. That could just represent these two things. I'm not too sure about Comex, not too sure about the shorts. Doesn't mean I'm not sure about gold. Doesn't mean I'm not sure about my metal in the Comex warehouse. Okay, it just means that I'm not sure about the Comex system and whether it's margining and all of that stuff is right and working. So to me, it's a sort of a question of degrees of distrust. So I'm going to propose DOD, it's my abbreviation, you see why I've chosen DOD. Degrees of distrust. So first one is, this is degrees of distrust in the system, I suppose, what I'm saying. So some pointers for the future maybe for us to look for. So the first is increasing investment in gold is the first indicator there's more distrust in the system. And that's reflected by the increasing stocks that we see. And that shows more people are buying gold. So this is the sort of first indication. Okay, but they're okay with storing it in the system. They're not that distrustful. It's just a slight. So I've just called that SIS for abbreviation, storing it in the system. So they're happy with the system, just vaguely distrustful. And then what we see is maybe it's occasional backwardation. Okay, so it comes and goes. And maybe it's really just in the short end of the curve. 
Okay? So just as the professor said, I don't know, so I'll just draw this up so everyone's clear. You know, that's the spot price. And on here we might have today and one month, two months, three months and so on. So the futures price goes in the back relation here because it's lower than that. But it's only lower at the short end of the term on this short. Still the can tango further out. Okay. And again, this could just represent, and this does happen, we see the curve. Um, it does also represent arbitrage ability, inability to actually take advantage of the arbitrage because of such small time frames. And I might go into that later because just because there is a backwardation doesn't, if it's not actionable you can't arbitrage it because it's just not possible to get enough metal from London, ship it in the cost and the funding cost to get it in to actually execute the arbitrage, then, then the arbitrage can, can exist, that, that divergence can exist. So let's say we've got this situation, which I think is where we're at sort of now. We're getting occasional backwardation that pops back up. So what is that saying? It's saying that the longs are arbitraging it away. Appears, and they go, oh, I, I see a profit here. I'll take advantage of it. Because remember, they've got the metal in coma, so they don't have to do any work. They're already long. They've already factored that into their plans. All they have to do is sell that long, buy the near whatever contract, and take the profit. So they still have a belief in the system to take advantage of that arbitrage, take a little bit of risk to make a bit of profit. And the gold's still in the system. So my third suggestion is that we start to see more backwardation periods there, a little bit more prolonged. And they're not just at the short end. So now the because you can explain this away, professionals in the industry can explain this away by saying, oh, it's difficult to take advantage of this arbitrage in bulk. And I can go into that. But what we're talking about now is the curve's going more like this. So there's more, I mean, longer and longer outing contracts start to go into backwardation. And it's not just the short stuff. It's not temporary. It's not um, small things. So what does that say? That's saying people are having less comfortable in taking the risk now in taking that great offer that they're making, okay? And stock in the system, I would theorise, I'm just theorising, would start to slow. So maybe that's an indicator for us. We see that inventory gain, it's a good sign to start with. But maybe when we start seeing that inventory declining, while the gold price is still going up, I'd add, because based on my experience, we have expecting the gold price drops that we have investor interest dropping. But if the stock's going down, but the gold price is still going up, then it must indicate there's starting to be less interest in the system. And then what we get is persistent. And the long end starts to drop down, which is very difficult to explain. This forward curve starts to go on the spot the whole way. Because <clears throat> the curve will move together, it'll drop in, I think. And what is that? That is probably reflecting, I, I'm surmising, that people are starting to see this third thing where they're starting to see more persistent backwardation. They're starting to interpret that. We've already interpreted, we know well ahead, but others will take some time to learn through the hard way. But maybe now some people who haven't had our benefit starting to ask some questions and interpreting this as a signal that not everything's going too well, something funny going, especially if it's this long end that's starting to going to backwardation. And so what happens? Gold gets pulled and it's stored outside the system. So that's SOS. Okay. That's why I picked SOS and DOD because I wanted to get that thing going. Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. I just have one more slide. Um, and this is a really good slide that Nick's put together. And what it shows on the top is the total open interest into ounce terms. So right now he's saying it's close to 50 million ounces. And then the stocks, which is 10 million. And he divides the two. So now he's put it in as terms of there are five 
owners per ounce, which is sort of, you know, saying for every ounce that's in the system, there's five claims. Or is another way of saying there's 20% cover. Okay? Yeah. So 20% of this metal's got some, these open interests has got metal against it. Um, what is interesting is obviously this period here. So why I mention it is, and if you think back to 97, 98, that's Asian financial crisis, long-term capital management, Russian okay, defaults. So the stress that we're, we're not seeing really at the moment, we're nowhere near where we even were here. Okay? So actually we are not, at the moment, we're not probably at this point if this is now getting up to this point here, if this didn't break the system, who knows what games are played anyway, but if this didn't break the system, and okay, there were a lot less debt levels and all those other factors to take into account, it's a different game then. So maybe this only needs to go to here to be a problem. But I'll just point out that this is sort of in line historically, okay? But we're so, this is also something that we probably need to keep in mind on and keep an eye on. Um, yeah, so, that is it, relatively short, um, but my theory of what indicators to look for is backwardation. But you know, I, don't, I don't think people, you know, it's the sort of boiling frog thing where you put that frog in the water and it slowly heats it up and they don't realise it's getting hotter and hotter. So I, I don't think all of a sudden we will have, you know, some, suddenly we're here and all of a sudden everything's in backwardation and that's it. You know, it'll be periods of dropping in, then I'll increase, I'll increase, people start to get less comfortable. Anyway, it's just my theory. I see Nathan's going to... No, I'm interested in your question, but I'm not a critique. Ron, would you say fair logic that the last bit about, uh, right now, there are about uh, 20% of the gold ounces there that are represented by the coin trading. Would you say that the fair analysis uh, to draw an analogy to a company that is near bankruptcy and the bonds trading no longer at, at par but trading at 20 cents on a dollar because I saw this argument, I don't remember who advanced it, but I saw it on the internet about well, gold is falling on the COMEX because people are realizing that it's like a fractional reserve bank and it makes sense that the COMEX gold price is falling because those act, that actual investment, if it gets split up pro rata, people may only get I don't know because remember a lot of the players in the market are not interested in settling for physical. Both the long and the short, they're speculators. They're just happy to settle that thing at the end of the period for cash. So it, to me it's not necessarily a problem that there's 20% cover as long as the 80% are all happy settling for cash and just speculating. Are we, are we, is there data to support that? Can we, can we see that on a daily basis? How many people say, I'll take physical things? Well, in some sense, the stock level's showing us that. Because well, that's that a, would, it, I'm not it's a bit smart, hard. But it would seem to me with stock levels going down and interest going up, there are more people saying, I'll just take the physical things. Yeah. So is that what's, I mean, that, that graph you showed that showed that peak in 06, and we got a lot more interest today and the stock level's going down, yeah. is that just well, sim that's why this simplistically is, saying, I'll just take mine in? Yeah, it is, but that's why this is important, because it puts it in relativity to the actual volume that's on the market, you know. I mean, when we looked back and we saw right now we've got 10 million ounces, and in 1980 it was three or four, it, you can see here in 1980, it's sort of where it was now. It's, it's not... You know, obviously 1980 was less volume of business, less people, there's more people in the world, there's more interest. So, you know, it, it's one of these classic things where I think you've got to look at this over time and in relation to some sort of indicator to get it in proportional terms, which is what this line, the black line down the bottom tells us is proportionately, it's probably at the moment we're no different to where we, where we were in 1980, it's in balance. When that starts to go up, um, sorry, get worse, then yes, that's what's happening because there's now more claims but people are pulling the metal out of the system. There's not as much metal to back up those increased interest in gold. Yep. And is it really fair to say number of owners grounds? Because there's a short side there too. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's... I, I think that's pushing it a little bit. <coughs> Normally um, on your side... Yeah, percentage cover would be what I... Yeah, Nick, Nick's chosen so owners... So interest, and theoretically that's, that's offset by... I suppose Nick's choice of that word is saying that at some point, first talking about, all the longs 
We want to take delivery. Yeah. So in that case, we can deliver or choose not to deliver. Yeah, and then this number pops up. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's where he's he's coming from. But um, anyway, it's just a relativity error. How how does the um, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a rumor or a fact, but apparently some um, take delivery not in metal, but in ETF shares. And if that's the case, especially I guess institutional players as opposed to individual players on the comics, what kind of effect, how, how does that get? Well that, yeah, look, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll defer to Tom Sarbo, who was here last year, and he wrote a very good thing about that. thing that you're talking about is exchange for physical. is does not mean um, settling a contract with an ETF. Um, you can't settle a contract well, with, do. A, with an ETF share. They do. They do. Now, they do an exchange for physical, which is not the same thing. If you look at the COMEX rules, it still says you've got to have kilo bars, 100 ounce bars in the warehouse. The exchange for physical is, you've got a futures contract, I've got some gold or an ETF share, and I say let's do a swap. So I take that COMEX contract from you and I give you the gold that I've got. The COMEX contract still exists, it's not clear, it's not settled, it doesn't disappear, it still exists. I've just done a swap for it. Yes. And then that makes me a cash settled and whatever side that I've taken on that contract, I've got to have the gold to back that up. So it's very close to it, but it's not exactly the same. The, the comments, the owner of the futures contract that wishes to take delivery that is being offered and it's, and it has delivery the equivalent in ETF shares. It doesn't have to. It, it, it is it delivery of the, of the metal? No, but he, but he can't He can't be forced to take those ETF shares. It's an exchange for physical transaction. The person who's saying, I'm offering to do this exchange is so I'll take your contract and give you this. I'm not he saying doesn't have force. I'm saying it's, it's happening because they don't see the difference. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, they yeah, don't yeah. see the difference. So how much? Yeah, so institutional client. Institutional client. Yeah, yeah okay, guys. Sorry, they want to get the metal in the back. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Right? Right? Yeah. So uh, they they uh, they're quite happy with getting ETF shares. Yeah. But if that wasn't happening, if there was none of that happening, what what kind of what what would that wouldn't that chart show but that's that that which you're proposing is no different to me i'm holding a long contract and i take delivery and then i ask the comics warehouse to ship it to me in perth it would disappear just as just the same and that because uh, this this chart is about comics warehouse it's yeah. not about etf warehouse it's that's about right. comics warehouse. yeah but remember in those etf stocks there's still the out, outflow of that you can still take metal out of the system if you're yeah, yeah, so that's what I mean. You're a believer. No, I'm not a believer. What I'm saying, what, what, you're, what you're saying is that by doing that, the it's not showing up in the stock. But that's no different to me taking physical delivery in a Comex warehouse and then asking them to ship it out of the system. It's the same thing. Now, whether I'm whether what I'm taking out of the system is, is equivalent to gold or not is another question. But from our point of view, of looking at the Comex stock, it's the same thing as having had taken delivery and then removing it out, which is the storing outside the system indicator. Now whether they're storing it outside, they're smart enough to store it properly, in, and the vehicle they've chosen is right, that's a separate analysis, and then we start looking at the ETF stocks and seeing what's happening to those and trying to make a further assessment. What happens if the clearinghouse of COMEX declares one sunny day that ETFs are acceptable for delivery. I mean, they could do that. They, they could. They, they could. could. Yeah. And, and that would catch a lot of people unaware because... <coughs> yeah, it's possible. I mean, uh, I mean that would be a, a, a very interesting indicator. I think, um, I mean, I can't say any more beyond that, but um, <coughs> There was what there was a re uh, announcement not long ago about um, uh, was it um, CME taking um, London as collateral? Sandu, what was that? Uh, I, uh, I, I think CME takes on collateral. I think they're accepting London metal accounts as collateral against forward contracts. Or something. I, I was under the impression that COMEX already allow ETFs. Yes. <laughs> yes. They they already allow that, Professor. Yep. Yep. You can you can settle in 
an ETF if you want to. <laughs> Ron, this might help. I don't know whether it will or not, but um, could you explain the difference between me owning shares of Street Tracks Gold and me owning unallocated Perf Mint Gold? Well, in some sense, there's not any difference in that the real result is that you've got a claim to gold. The question is, what has that person got behind it? Correct. Yeah. We're talking trust here, are we? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, that's what it comes that, to. That really, I think, is a very important thing for people who actually, I mean, I actually do have these things, and so it matters to me. And it, when you start talking about sovereign risk and levels of trust and what it's backed by, it seems to me that one element of the risk management uh, structure is based on uh, what you perceive that trust um, yeah, uh, is. And, and that's why, um, if you go to our website, and um, we mentioned it, um, someone mentioned it to me, there was a page on our website, and I wrote it many years ago, and managed to get it under the noses of anyone. But what it said in there, what okay. I said is, yes, um, what I said there is, um, this is this question of unallocated and allocated and what should I do? And you're right, it's about a risk assessment. Everyone's got a different assessment of that. And what I said was, the thing about unallocated is that it is free, so that's a pretty substantial advantage because you don't have many years of free storage. But it's not risk-free because you know it's all stuck in operations. And if everyone turned up at the door, there would be a delay. Well, we'd say, well, the first people to get the coins, we can only make you know, 18 million coins a year, so you know, 10, 2 million coins a, a month or something, whatever our capacity is. Some people would have to wait. So it's not immediate. It doesn't mean we don't have the goals, but you know, there's production capacity limit. So it is not without risk. Uh, sorry? I just uh, no, no. Uh, Marcus. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, John is going to tell us the results of the health. Oh, no. <laughs> First place was uh, Crime Scene, it was pretty close between Crime Scene and Shopping. Second came Shopping, third was Moringa, and fourth was the Master of uh, well, yeah. sure Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what I said in there is that if you're not sure when disaster is going to occur, then you can hold unallocated for a period of time because you get free storage and that, that period, and some of our clients have held for 10, 15 years. But when you perceive the risk getting higher, you go allocated, and then when you perceive the risk getting higher, you take delivery. Now, at what point you do that is different for everyone, you know, because everyone has a different assessment of risk. And for the case of myself and David, we live in Perth, so we know that we can always run right up to the mid knock on the door and get stuff. It's a little bit different for someone in America who might say, I need, I'm going to take delivery and have it delivered to me, you know, well in advance. So you're right, this is all about trust and system. Everyone's going to have a different degree of trust. That's why I think it'll happen in phases. I think we'll see it. It won't be just sudden, you know. That will probably occur, but I think it's still the phase where people, people lose confidence slowly at different levels. Uh, don't you think, or am I right in thinking that uh, settlement in ETF shares is one step towards settlement in cash? So you're moving from gold to gold shares to cash. So it's a baby step in that direction, at least. Yeah, it is. But again, we're talking about people who have trust in the system. So yeah, we're still at that first, second stage. So to them, there's no no problem with that. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. Uh, only understanding there are no dumb questions. Yeah. Can I ask you one? Yes. I <laughs> I'm not a trader. I don't understand about gold price manipulation. But what I've picked up from reading stuff, mostly Doug Casey and Ed Steen, and if you go to those characters, yeah. that right. And they talk about the number of shorts, the sheer volume of open interest shorts taken out by the likes of J.P. Morgan, the suspected because yeah. there's no direct evidence of that one, but they suspect it's the arm of the Fed. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, if you take out a whole load of shorts and you drive the market into that sentiment, you're basically saying, you know, it can only go down. You're trying to force that sentiment. Mm. How does that manipulate the price of gold if there's belief out there otherwise? Um. Well, no, it's perception. I mean, remember that for every long there's a short, so here we're only talking 50 million ounces. Remember, we've got just investor stock over 150 million. 
Okay, so it's a perception game. And that's why I'm saying because Comic stock's so visible, none of the other stocks are, you can do that. You can sort of paint the tape in a way, make it appear people are obsessive about this, then you play with that stock figure and do what you want to do with it. So, so it yeah. seems every time the market opens, like London or Hong Kong, the price starts to go up. Like just recently it's been going up a bit. This guy, Ed Steele, will write, oh, so many open interest uh, numbers and counts and the number of shorts they have. And that drives the price back down. Are they constantly wrestling the price down? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, traders are traders even if you don't believe in manipulation. You just at least believe that the proprietary traders and, you know, financial firms will, will all try and be gaming and playing each other. So absolutely. But I mean, in terms of the COMEX, I mean, keep in mind as well, and a lot of people have talked about the huge short position, remember that's, even if that entire thing was totally short by one institution, it's only 50 million ounces, there's 850 private investors, there's another you know, X amount of central banks, so there can be gold against that. And it's quite possible if I wanted to, well, I'd go in, I'll sell a whole of short contract, I'll just go and buy gold on the spot market. Yeah. Stick it in the vault. Now the perception on the market is this massive shorts and big dudes come in and shorting the market. You know, but I'm actually completely neutral. And hedges just I got long in the OTC, but no one can see the over-the-counter market. So these games can be played, absolutely. You've got to keep that stuff in mind. And but you'd be naive to think that JP Morgan etc. would all play the OTC market as well. If it was really in their best interest to do so, it wouldn't just be in the visible COMEX uh, field, they'd be elsewhere. Yeah, they would be, yeah. But they might go short 50 million and go long a little bit more or a bit less, depending on what game they want to play. I'm just saying, because a lot of the market is off the market, it's not visible, you've got to be careful about yeah. putting too much weight on the visible stuff. Yeah. You know? And that's why on the ETFs, one of the most interesting things when the ETFs first launch, because we've got our own ETFs, so I know how they work from a mechanical point of view, settlement and how they operate is that it was really interesting to see them go up and hold their value, their amount of gold in stock. Because what we saw in ours is going up and down, up and down. And what was happening, I believe, because they just launched it and they wanted to have a successful launch, is it entirely possible that a bullion bank or the sponsors or whatever could bought a whole lot of ETF shares. Okay, so they'll all the ETF shares and look like the ETF volumes are increasing at the start of the, you know, the issue and how successful it was. And they're just short in the over-the-counter market. They're completely neutral, but they just make it look like this thing's really good. And it was really puzzling to us because we just saw the holdings being flat no matter as the price went up and down, and then it would step up. So they were effectively pre-buying stuff, going short, and then selling it in dribs and drabs as the actual real investor interest came in, and then they just closed their shorts that they were doing over counter money. So you've got to keep those things all in mind when you look at any of these things. Were you analyzing SPDR? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, think? yeah. Extremely interesting. Because I find, I do it too, and I find it mm, curious. Yeah. But then also, if you think about it, the parcels are quite large. So you've got 100,000 ounces. I mean, that's what they do. They buy 100,000 ounces of ETF shares. I've got the shares. I'm short 100,000 on Comix. And then as someone buys on the market a thousand ounces, I square off the Chromex contract, another thousand, another thousand, I sell down my ETF shares, and then I buy another one. And that's how the market makers make the market in them. It's perfectly legitimate, but it sort of smooths out the holdings. So you probably, that's what we found interesting, is that the ETF holdings were more smoother than what we saw happening in our own product and our own business. So we knew the market makers were, I wouldn't necessarily say manipulating, but certainly you know, stepping it and buying in bulk and... Wouldn't you say, though, as a consumer, that that would be something that you, you should look at cautiously? Because I think the average person thinks an ETF is a, is a good bullion vault. No, they and do, it's and because they... Yeah, I mean, I yeah, used yeah. to think that, too, and I'm, you know... I'm, I'm no, you're right, and the, some, the, the mistake is because they think in a company, all the shares of that company are on that market. So you know the total amount of shares and you can look at volume. And what they're not thinking about when they look at these ETFs is that's just a 5% of the all the gold. So gold can come in and out of that thing. You can't just look at its volume of issued shares, if you want to call them that, as being the total amount. You know, so typical analysis, stock market analysis of volume and trading in a company doesn't really apply to the ETF because it's not the full stock on issue, if you want to call it that. Yes, Alex? Uh, yeah. Well, with regards to script tracks, my understanding is that uh, they've got an arrangement and it's in the fine print whereby uh, custodians of the gold, sub-custodians, can afford, like sub-custodians who cannot actually be ordered. So 
the site, you have to go and yep. uh, type the cash. Uh, yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, so and that is, is very dodgy. Yeah, it is, and that is very dodgy. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, ETFs are a competitor of ours, so, you know. <laughs> I would love to to completely attack them, but some things I can't. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to do that just because it puts my case. I think there's something that's right about them. There's something right. That particular thing is dodgy. The fact that you can't take delivery of it at a retail level. It's not very hard, but it's very easy for them to make a delivery because most of those market makers and ETF shares are London banks. They got London metal accounts. They can easily create an arrangement with Royal Canadian Mint or ourselves and said, hey Perth, look what we'll do is if a holder wants to redeem for physical, um, we'll process that, 10 ounces, we'll give you a credit in London, and then you give them the physical in Perth. And if they come to us and offer us that deal, we'd say, yeah, great, no problem, let's get extra coins we can sell. But you know, they don't do that. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> logistic question. Yes. Yeah. For December contract, uh, future. Uh, when we give notice, when we take delivery, and when we give uh, payment, the long and short, and compare them with London forward, is, is it much Well, Comix is a more fixed time and fixed size. Let's say December, do we give notice three days before? Uh, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure of the fine mechanics. Does that uh, affect the understanding of calculation of pieces? Yes, it does, it does. But keep in mind, just when you mentioned forwards, the forward market is totally customised. So I can go to a bullion bank and say I want to buy gold forward on this exact day, you know, for this exact ounces. I don't have to limit myself to 100 ounce lots and have to limit myself to the contracts as they are fixed to expire at certain months on payments. The forward market's a lot more flexible in that. What about the future? The future market. Future's more. Let's say December is the 31st. Yeah. Let's say three days before you get this. And then when you pay up. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the the, the actual mechanics. The final shot was to do no piece and then deliver. Yeah. Sorry, mate. It's, it's easy yeah. enough to get specifications for contracts. They give you all this stuff. Yeah, the price, you know, and uh, how much uh, you have to put up your margin calls and all that stuff. It's it's on the comics or you go to a broker if you have an account with you all this information. So, uh, like for example, initial and maintenance margins change. As their perception of risk changes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and if so it's 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 right. the boom it goes up, and, it and so you, can, you have to keep track of it. But yeah. It's available pretty easily online. Oh, oh, okay. Because my broker, oh, 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 give, give me notice one month before. December, December. Well, he's probably got his back office just <laughs> time delays to process and get it. It's, probably it's the trading house you deal with that you have to yeah. deal with. Because exactly. they work through Comex. They don't necessarily have the same margin. Comex has a certain margin. These guys need to just stretch it a little bit more. So. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, no. Okay, Ron, can you uh, clarify? It sounds like what you're saying earlier there, you're um, in agreement with the professor's theory about the, uh, the, the bull and bear skin, that uh, there could be large holders of physical bullion who are shorting on the Comex, and then when they drive the price down successfully, never standing for delivery there, or rather uh, always just doing their trades for cash there, and then taking their cash profits on their short sale after they cover, and then back on the OTC market, carefully increasing their real physical in possession of the rewards. So is that, do you think that's a plausible theory for what may uh, Well, I'll have to think through the mechanics of it. I have sort of thought about the actual numbers and how you would get around doing that. I suppose my, my point is that <clears throat> because it's a smaller market, of the, of the, of the counter market is so much larger and not visible, those sort of things can be done, those strategies could be quite, yeah. I think we've exhausted everyone. <laughs> okay. Do you, like, is, do you keep, I mean, I just hope it's not a proprietary question, but there's a certain barometer you get from your clients as to where they are in the battle stations at yeah. Quadrant, right? I mean, I, I, you've read your bit, and it's good about how a person can look at it simplistically about whether I'd be an unallocated, allocated, buried in the backyard, yeah. and it's quite well written. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really helpful. Um, what am I seeing? Yes. Okay. Yes, we're seeing more physical. So we're seeing more people ring up and just buying to, That's buying to take physical, and we're taking, <laughs> and we're seeing more people collecting the unallocated. It's not like a massive tsunami of, at this point. You know, we had a little, as much as Jason Hobble, you know, likes to think he's super influential. <laughs> 
have a pump, you know, but we had a pump. It wasn't, it wasn't like a massive disaster and there were more operational inefficiencies in terms of dealing with people who wanted to take delivery. That was the problem. So he gave us a bump and it was funny because the senior bullion dealer when I said I was coming, she said, can't you, you know, encourage them to spread some rumours so we want to sell some more physical products, you know. <laughs> so she actually sees opportunity to make more profit to sell physical, you know. And, you know but no, but we are. We're seeing more interest now. So I don't know how much of the allocated is increasing and how much you're taking delivery, but it's certainly completely different to what it was five years ago. You know, it, there were people buying allocated and unallocated and very rarely anyone would take delivery. And now in the last year or two, we're just seeing a few more people taking, not all of it, but they're just taking our part and having it shipped over wherever to. So I don't think necessary, that, that, that sort of backing up to me is a little bit more distrust that's occurring. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say you have Indian ETFs in there, 200,000 ounces on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see that having more of an influence in the future? Well, I think that's actually a really interesting... Um, I mean, culturally, Indians don't like to have the gold in their hand. But can you see no, that they're taking advantage of those sort of see. structures in the future? Especially well, I don't think so. That's the thing. You see, that's what's really interesting. Why is this not advancing? Where is that chart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, there you go. India, the biggest, you know, they love gold. But isn't that pathetic? Yeah. 200,000 ounces, that's it. And that's over six of them. There's six products in there. Um, it just tells you they aren't interested in paper claims or they want physical. Um, Can you see that joke? Do you get any... Well, look, you know, there was a... Andy Smith was an analyst with Mitsubishi. Um, very um, uh, quite contra commentator. But he said, his theory was that as these developing countries became more developed, um, they would actually per capita take less gold. Because they were using gold as an insurance, wealth saving, and that as the economies got more wealthy, they were putting more of their disposable income into plasma screens. Plus, there are things like insurance, and you know, you've got a trust and institution, they're going to pay it on insurance contracts. So, in that sense, his theory was that over the next few decades that, the, that there would be less per capita interest in gold um, in developing countries. But I think we'll probably get to a problem and breakdown before we get to that point, you know, so I don't think it's sort of relevant. But I think this just shows they're not really interested in it. ETF. They know better. <laughs> so extended would agree. Follow what the Indians are doing. When they sell you sell, they're very smart. Exactly. They're the very smart. Exactly. No, it's easier to not No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The same as Dubai is finding the same the same thing, right? Yeah. Nobody's buying, buying the paper or um, stupid question I guess, but um, the, you started your presentation by saying there's hundred and sixty thousand tons. Yeah. And then you um, mentioned that the central banks are 29,000 tons and investors are 27,000 tons. Where's the other 100,000 tons? <laughs> uh, well, that's <laughs> jewelry. And that's actually where a little bit of the a catch is, to be honest. Is it really that much? Well, look, you know, I don't, I don't think I've never been able to find out yeah. where the World Gold Council and Goldfield Mineral Services yeah, actually yeah. backs up this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, you know, who knows? That's actually part of the problem. Is that 27 ton, thousand right? Yeah. I mean, and really, even if you want to be strictly correct, you've got to get, even if you believe that is that there's 100,000 that's jewellery and in, in industrial and some of that's you know, electronics or whatever. I mean, how much of the stuff that's in India is not really jewellery, it's really investment. So right. shouldn't it go into the investment category? But I suppose the point of this one here is their estimate of form that's in bar form, so that's stuff that could potentially come back into the market quickly, as opposed to I mean, Indian metal could be a bit of a lag as it gets refined and turned into 400 ounce bars. We have to take these official numbers a little bit uh, of sus suspicion, because yeah. uh, aren't they the same people who recently said, who didn't count what the central banks bought, because they're normally sellers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's starting to get quite complex because um, <laughs> Frank Veneroso has written on that, and, and you know his belief is that they have made some 
recording and methodological errors in how they do it and they can't back out of that. So anyway, I mean, it's getting a bit technical. But you're right, it is uncertain. I mean, the 160 could be uh, a lot larger as well. We don't know. We really don't know. It's just ballpark numbers. You'd have to ask Darren to watch up. Anyway, I think that's it. This is excellent.